Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are glad that you are here with us in person and those joining us online. Uh, This is the second Sunday in Lent. We do continue on our Lenten journey. Uh, You may see a number of quilts. Our quilters have been busy and we have more quilts to bless and to be sent out to members of our community and people in our community beyond our church membership. Um, We will be blessing them today. Uh, Also today, I have something new. (laughs) Uh, This is a box of, I'm calling it front row fidgets. If you are someone that um, benefits from having a fidget that is quiet, that can actually help you focus during worship, Um, These will be in the front row, and the idea is that you can use them during our worship service and return them so we have them there for the next week. And yes, you have to sit in the front row to use them, the front row, the front row chairs or the front pew. We have one on this side. I'm going, here they come for the front row. Awesome. (laughs) So um, I'm going to put this box on this side. Come on. Are there any other announcements from the congregation? Good morning. I'll take care of Ray's Ray. Um, Ray's Ray is due next Sunday to Brianna and myself. We're in the library by 10 30. So last night we were asked to do snacks. <laughs> For a youth group. Did you girls have fun? Yeah. What did, can you tell them what we did? Uh, we went to Trail Mix, Brownies, and Cookies. Yeah. And then we served them. So I hope you guys got to see the youth group in action. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to be this next Saturday, so watch for more information about that. We have a lot happening. We have the Palm Sunday breakfast and then another youth hangout. We're working a little quicker now to get the youth gen going, so we got a lot going on with youth group. Hopefully I'm not stealing Bob's thunder. Um, (laughs) Shelly asked me to speak a little bit about last evening's uh, film. And uh, for those who attended, uh, you know it very well. Uh, For those that still wish to contribute to the uh, uh, trafficking victims, uh, there's a number of organizations in the state of Wisconsin that assist uh, victims uh, of trafficking. And uh, we'll still accept donations for that uh, contribution. Trafficking isn't just something that happens in other countries. It's happening in America. It's very common. If you believe the film depicted it only happening, you know, in other countries, that's not really the reality. The reality is there's a lot of Americans, a lot of citizens, a lot of people of this country that are being trafficked. So, uh, Shelley, I don't have the, the numbers, but it's uh, an astounding number and uh, your support and recognition of the issue is much appreciated. I think, Scott, that point that it's the fastest growing under ground business. <clears throat> you speak to that? I, uh, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, that it's the fastest growing underground business. Correct. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's here, but whether you recognize it or to see it or not. And uh, there are people that uh, just disappear for a couple days at a time, and then they come back, and chances are they might be being trafficked. And it's 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 for labor as well as other uh, items. Anyway, it's a big subject. Um, needs a lot of attention, and we're working on uh, from a legislative standpoint to make that more identifiable and uh, more capable of. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Several years ago, I was told by a representative from Lutheran Social Services that every county in Wisconsin 
Every single county has been affected by human trafficking. Just to reiterate a little bit about that, uh, it was a real good movie last night. It, uh, it was a tough movie to see what's going on in our world, but uh, it, it's a, it is reality, I guess. So, but the reason I'm up here is uh, we'd like to reestablish uh, some ushering teams again here in St. Louis. Uh, the main duty would be doing the collection at um, the money collection and at College Heads. Uh, probably maybe doing some greeting out there for people that are coming in, uh, helping the deacon, doing various things. It's something really simple and easy, uh, making sure the doors are open, the lights are on, that the pastor is here, you know, simple things. Like that. <laughs> Anybody from 8 to 80 can do it. I mean, it's simple as that. Um, we can get a couple of youth to do it. Uh, a couple of older people to do it. Uh, I'd like to have two or three on the team, at least to start out with. A uh, family can do it, or a couple, husband and wife, whatever. So I'm gonna pass around the clipboard, uh, just sign up, and as things come together, uh, we'll be in contact with you and put something together. Thanks. Thank you. I would love to see one youth on there every week. I think that would be great, whether we have a family serving as ushers or just including our youth. In serving the church. Any other announcements? <coughs> All right, we will have a brief blessing of these quilts. If there's anyone that would like to come and lay hands on the quilts, either up here or in the front row, um, please do so. Gracious God, as we place our hands on these quilts, we join giver and receiver, recognizing the unity of all your people in the body of Christ. We celebrate being the children of God. We give thanks for the variety of gifts that compose these quilts, donations of money, fabric, thread, and faithful people who cut the squares, design the patterns, sew the tops, iron the fabric, make backs and fillers, tie and stitch the bindings. We celebrate generosity. We give thanks for the fellowship of all who work together to make the quilts, the laughter, the shared stories, the joy of crafting something with one's hands and heart for another, and the time to reflect and wonder about the recipient. We celebrate community. We send these quilts as a sign of God's love and blessing for each person who receives one, trusting that their quilts will be a source of comfort and hope, and a reminder that each recipient is a beloved child of God, we pray that these quilts will serve as a useful purpose in the life of the recipient, that they will bring warmth and the cold. May it be a step in recovering one's life and a message of care from someone they may never meet. We celebrate hope in the midst of life's trials. We ask that you bless the fruits of our labor and the whole mission of St. Luke's, that together we may minister to our neighbors in need. Bless all who give and all who receive as we are sown together in the unity of your Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation will please stand. We continue with confession and praise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We pour resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know. Forgive us, Lord. Amen. 
Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ.
pray together the prayer of the day. O oh God, God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to do for us the means of life. Grant us, so the glory of the cross of Christ, that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, may be seated. A reading from Judges. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Abu died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lebedah, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take position at Mount Tabor, bring ten, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops and I will give him into your hand. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I'd like to invite the children for the children's meeting to part. to the reading today and we talked about the book of Judges, okay? So I'm just going to ask a quick question. Book of Judges. Old Testament or New Testament? Old. Old Testament Judges. And the Old Testament is leading up to eventually Israel getting a king, okay? So Judges is before Israel gets a king. And each of the Judges have their own strengths and weaknesses. A lot like we do, right? So I'm going to read about my favorite judge to read about, and that would be the story of Samson, okay? Check out that artwork here, okay? I'm going to try to read this and then have you guys be able to see these beautiful pictures too. You do that. Just one more time, Lord. Once again, the people lost their way and worshipped idols, forgetting what God had done for them. So God allowed the Philistine to control the Israelites. Then the people cried out to God to forgive them and save them from their enemy. God answered their cries for help and sent a powerful man named Samson to help them fight the Philistines. Samson had a special gift from God. He is blessed with great strength. Once he fought a roaring lion with his bare hands, and he won. Samson killed many Philistines all by himself. We have to find a way to get rid of him. The Philistines plotted. Samson was madly in love with Delilah. Delilah only pretended to love Samson, 
because the Philistines promised her money if she discovered what made Samson so strong. Delilah tried to trick Samson into telling the secret of his strength. Samson knew he should not tell the secret to anyone, so he tried to trick Delilah too. First, he told her that being tied with new leather straps would weaken him enough to be captured. The Philistines tried it. It didn't work. Samson broke the leather straps as if they were made of paper. <coughs> Delilah tried again. If you really love me, you will tell me your secret, she said. Samson made up another story. I'll lose my power if someone ties me with new ropes. While Samson slept, Delilah tied him up, and the Philistines tried to capture him, but Samson snapped the ropes like tiny threads. Delilah really wanted that money, so she said, You lied! If you love me, tell me your secret! Samson could not stand her nagging anymore. He finally gave in and told Delilah the secret of his strength. It's my hair. It's never been cut. If someone shaved my head, I would lose my strength and be as weak as any other man. Delilah waited for Samson to fall asleep. Then she cut his hair. When the Philistines came, Samson couldn't fight them off. The Philistines treated him badly, blinding him and putting him in jail. One day, the Philistine rulers brought Samson to the temple to show off their prized prisoner. They claimed him, they chained him to two temple pillars. They bragged and made fun of the once powerful Israelite. Samson prayed and asked God to give him strength just one more time so he could defeat the Philistines. God listened and answered Samson's prayer. Then Samson pushed on the pillars with all his might, and the temple came crashing down. All the Philistines were killed. Samson died too, but he was remembered as a man of great power who knew his strength came from the Lord. And then a little prayer on the end here. I'm going to read quick, and then we'll, we'll talk real quick about the story, okay? God's message. I am God Almighty. My strength shines through the leaders of my people. Call on me, and I will answer. I will use my power to raise you up. So, what did you think of the Samson story? It, yeah, it was. And, but if you look at the judges and a lot of people that, that God uses throughout his story, they all have a strength. So what was the strength of Samson? Strength, strength physical strength, being powerful, okay? Uh, I think maybe him being loyalty, could have he was loyal to God in a way, but he was loyal to Lila as well. Like, he was kind of conflicted there. So that could be a weakness of, of Samson. What else was a weakness of Samson that you guys would go and think of? Yeah, his hair. He cut his hair off, and that was his weakness. So if, if you read through um, judges, all these judges lead up, and they all have their certain strengths and weaknesses, right? And the same thing with us. All of us have different gifts and strengths and weaknesses from, from God. And it's up for us, it's up to us, to identify what our strengths and weaknesses are, right? And if we have a strength, what should we try to do with the strength? Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord to make our strength even better. Work on our strength. Use it to glorify God. You know, if you're a great singer, you want to use that to glorify God's name and share it with other people, right? If you have a weakness, Pastor, do their weaknesses ever go away? No. No, they're never going to go away. But if we identify what they are, we can work on them and get better at them, right? So let's say a little prayer together, everybody, okay? Dear Lord, thank you for sending... Uh, these amazing people, these judges, these kings, these people for us to look at. But help us learn from their mistakes. Help us to identify what our strengths and weaknesses are so we can work them, so we can magnify them to glorify you. Help us to help other people find their strength and use them in your name as well. Amen. 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 We continue with the video. Oh, I got sheets for you all. Let's turn these all out. Hold on here. Here you go. Thanks for coming down. Here you are.
Joshua died, the Israelites began to worship other gods. Because of this, God caused them to lose their battles and become slaves of other nations. Each time this happened, God would raise up one man or woman called a judge to help the Israelites escape. But after each escape, Israel would go back to their old ways, not living how God had told them to live. Then they would lose another battle and fall back into slavery. This cycle happened over and over again. At one point, the Israelites were enslaved in a country called Midian. They cried out to God for rescue, and God sent an angel to a man named Gideon to help them. God told Gideon the only way to beat the Midianites was to send only a small number of soldiers, just 300. So, in the middle of the night, the 300 soldiers came to the edge of the Midianite camp, blew their trumpets all at once, and smashed jars with torches in them. The incredible sight and sound this made confused and terrified the Midianites so much they began to kill one another. Gideon and the Israelites chased the remaining Midianites and killed them all. After this battle, Israel enjoyed 40 years of peace. But when Gideon died, the Israelites went back to their old ways, worshiping other gods. So they were captured by the Philistines. God sent another judge named Samson. Samson had long hair and was incredibly strong. At one point, he actually killed a wild lion with his bare hands, tearing it to pieces. The Philistine leaders were afraid of Samson because of his incredible strength. So they came up with a plan. They knew Samson had fallen in love with a woman named Delilah. So they paid her to find out the secret behind his superhuman strength. After much convincing, Samson revealed that his long hair made him strong. Soon after, while Samson was sleeping, Delilah led the leaders into his room and they cut off his hair. With his strength gone, the Philistines gouged his eyes out and threw him in prison. While there, his hair grew back and his strength began to return. One day, while the Philistines were partying, they took Samson out of the prison, forcing him to perform in front of them in their palace. While standing between two pillars, Samson prayed that God would give him strength. Then he placed his hands on the pillars and shook them until the roof of the palace completely caved in, killing all the Philistines as well as himself. After Samson's death, the Israelites' pattern of disobedience continued, and God would need to look outside of Israel for someone who would follow God's ways. Trying something new, new today. I've been wanting to do it for two years. I'm using pictures with my son. However, we haven't gotten the remote quite working yet. <laughs> so, and we didn't really come up with a sign for changing the slide, did we? No. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. They have. We'll figure it out. <laughs> so, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. That's where we are. Those first five books are called what? The, the Torah, the Pentateuch, first five, Pentateuch, five. What did we say last week that the next set of books is called? Joshua, Judges, continuing, what, what are those books called? They are part of the Deuteron Deuteronomic history. I've also seen it Deuteronomistic, that's a mouthful history, which takes us from um, the end of the wandering in the wilderness, going into promised land, up until the Babylonian exile. That's the period of time we are looking at. And as we heard in the children's sermon, God was sending judges. So here we have jo this verse from Joshua. It is a reminder of where we are and what is going on. Joshua conquered the whole land, including the hill country and the Negev, all the land of Goshen, the lowlands, the Arabah, the hill country of Israel, and its lowlands. 
Joshua campaigned against these kings for quite some time. So that's what we heard about last week, right? Joshua leading the people in this taking of the promised land. Was this something that happened overnight? No, absolutely not. It took many people and many years um, to take all of the promised land. Now you can switch. <laughs> so in Judges, there is no single leader. Joshua had died. Remember, people had separated again into the 12 tribes. So there's no one leader leading everyone in a unified campaign. We have these individual tribes, not a unified campaign, and the inhabitants have not been completely eradicated. You know, we hear about them going from place to place and wiping out this group and wiping out that group, but Judges lists 20 cities that were not conquered. So there are still these remnants of people in Canaan, and they will influence the Israelites who are taking over the Promised Land. So Canaan was gradually occupied. It was something that took a number of years. Okay. So maybe, good, you can see that. These would be like the judges' trading cards. How many judges are there? Six on this one. How many all together do we know about? Twelve. There's another slide of judges. Uh, and we don't often hear about some of these minor judges. We hear a lot about Deborah and Gideon and Samson, but we don't hear about some of these smaller ones. Would you like to hear? Yes, we would love to, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me see. Othniel. Othniel, the first one there, top left, is either the nephew or brother of Caleb. Anyone remember who Caleb is? Who's Caleb? One of the spies who went into the Yes, one of the spies who went with Joshua into the promised land. And Othniel is Israel's first judge. Ehud, the second one, middle, top, whose name means, where's the glory, is most known for two things. Being left-handed, any lefties out there? Yeah, I've got a number of them here. <laughs> and brutally killing the king of the Moabites. Shag Shagmar, top right. Shagmar was a judge, but he could only get one verse, we only get one verse to learn about what he did. And, and it said, it's Josh, Judges 3.31. After Ehud came Shagmar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, he too saved Israel. You may be asking yourself, what's an ox goad, pastor? You want to know what an ox goad is? essentially an ancient cattle prod, an eight-foot wooden rod with a metal spike on the end. So it's basically a spear. So saying he killed 600 <laughs> Philistines with a cattle prod, Sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? All right, Deborah. What do we know about Deborah? She was a prophetess and a judge. Her name means honeybee. And she was also the wife of a man, man named Lapidot. She's the only female judge. She was leading the Israelites. She summoned Barak to command the Israelite army, telling him God would give Sisera and his army into his hand. But you may have noted in the reading that Cicero, that um, Cicero wouldn't be taken by Barak, who would be the one to take Cicero out. Jail with the tent, the tent peg. After all this victory over Cicero, Deborah wrote a song celebrating what God has done. It is known as the Song of Deborah. You can find it in Judges 5. And it is believed to be one of the oldest biblical passages. All right, Gideon. What do we know about Gideon? <laughs> Gideon got the Bibles in hotels. Yes. <laughs> this is the most well known judge and an important leader from the book of Judges. There are more verses dedicated to Gideon than any other judge. Interestingly, the Bible never explicitly calls him a judge or states that he saved Israel. But as we see with the other judges, 
an angel appeared to give Gideon. And what did Gideon do when the angel of the Lord appeared to him? He tested God, right? He questioned, okay, is this the real deal? There was a fleece on the threshing floor. And he said, well, make the, if, if this is really you, God, the angel of the Lord, make the fleece wet and the floor dry. And it happened. And then vice versa. Once wasn't good enough. Okay, make the floor fleece dry and the floor wet with dew. Testing God. Hmm. That's what we know Gideon for. The fleece test. Tola, the last one on the screen, is what we call a minor judge. Like a minor major prophet, minor judge, uh, minor judge what do you think that is? Just less, less verses about them, less we know about them. The Bible says Tola rose and saved Israel in Judges 10.1, but it doesn't tell us when he saved them from. Could have been anything. He only gets two verses, Judges 10.1 and 2. Next slide. <coughs> Jer, another minor judge. Jer gets about the same coverage as Tola does. Three verses, though. In Judges 10, 3 through 5. He was followed by Jair of Gilead, who led the Israel 22 years. He had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys. They controlled 30 towns in Gilead, which to this day are called Havon Jair. 30 must be his lucky number, I would say. Okay, Jephthah. We read about Jephthah in Judges 10, 6 through 12, 7. While he delivered Israelites from their enemies, this is one of the great tragedies in scripture uh, involving the loss of his daughter, actually the sacrifice of his daughter. Uh, I, I encourage you to read it. It is a very heavy story that we find in the book of Judges about Jephthah. Next we have Idzan of Bethlehem led Israel for seven years. He's only mentioned in Judges 12, 8 through 10. A lot of these only get three verses, don't they? No record of any Israelites he fought or enemies he overthrew, nor does it say he saved them. The only thing we know about him is he had 30 sons and 30 daughters. 30 again, right? And he made a point of marrying all of them to people outside his tribe. Elon, not Elon Musk, <laughs> is from the tribe of Zebulun, and perhaps the most unknown judge. He gets two sentences, Judges 12, 11, and 12. After him, Eli, the Zebulunite, led Israel for 10 years. That's all, all we hear of him. And then we have Abdan, another minor judge. Everything Judges tells us about him is in two verses in Judges 12. He had 40 sons, 30 grandsons, who rode on 70 donkeys. He led Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, died and was buried in Ephraim. And then, finally, we have Samson, who we know for what? His strength and his hair. And his strength, well, it, his hair would be his demise, but his strength was used to uh, take out other people. All right, next. So in Judges, like we heard with the wandering in the wilderness, there is this cycle going on. And what's the cycle? Yes. <laughs> the people are following God and God's commands, and then they stray. And so that remnant of people in Canaan are influencing what is going on with the Israelites. Because they're going back to worshiping other gods. And what is God doing in response to all of this? Sending in a judge to make things right, to save them, to respond to their cry for help, and then have a period of peace. And then the cycle goes back around again. You can go to the next slide. This is the cycle. <laughs> so you start up at the one o'clock-ish. Israelites do evil. God is angry. The Israelites cry to God for help. God sends a judge, takes care of it, and a period of peace follows. But then we hear that with each cycle, the sin seems to get worse and worse and worse. Continue. 
Um, this is my son, <laughs> circa 2011, 2007, and there's this piece of playground equipment <coughs> that um, we had in a park in South Carolina. Oh, no, go back. <laughs> um, and you try to balance on it, and you move, and the thing is moving, and he called it, now you can go, the spin cycle. <laughs> and I don't know if that's a look of pure joy or pure terror on his face. <laughs> I think he experienced both on that. And this is the cycle that the Israelites were in during this period of judges. It's like a spin cycle, right? You're going around and around. You think you're doing better. You're doing better on some situation in your life. And nope, then that happens. Or no, you're back in an old pattern. And it continues and continues and continues. So we have this spin cycle. And I think that was a perfect thing for that. Perfect. It's really a sin cycle, right? We continually fall, we fall short and we sin and we continue to sin the best of our intentions without God's help and God's grace and God's forgiveness, we, we can't break these cycles, can we? We need God's help. We need God's strength. We need God's deliverance to break free from this cycle. Very much looks like that, doesn't it? We sin. Oh, God gets angry with us, per se. Maybe disappointed, maybe sad to see us repeating the same old patterns. And we find ourselves crying out to God, God, save me. Save me from whatever situation, or sometimes it's save me from myself. Save me from this pattern I'm falling into. And then things improve, the situation improves, we change our attitude, we change how we're looking at things and responding to things, and then there's a period of peace until there's another lesson for us to learn where God is trying to teach us something, where that mirror will be held up, the mirror of our sin, so we can grow as Christians. Okay. So, there is this tension, right, in, in the book of Judges, where there is God's justice bringing in his judges, but God is merciful at the same time. And it, it's this ebb and flow. God is not giving up on God's people. And God never gives up on us. We continue to sin, we continue to fall, we continue to fail. But we live in this tension as well. But we are met with mercy. We are met with love. We are met with forgiveness. Last one. <laughs> it's this tension, but it's always kind of a loose tension. So I'd like to share with you what is known as the knot prayer. K-N-O-T. Have you heard of this prayer or a version of it? Dear God, please untie the knots that are in my mind, in my heart, in my life. Remove the have nots, the can nots, and the do nots. Erase the will nots, the may nots, and the might nots that may find a home in my heart. Release me from the could nots, the would nots, the should nots that obstruct my life. And most of all, dear God, I ask you remove from my mind, my heart, and my life all of the am nots that I have allowed to hold me back, especially the thought that I am not good enough. Amen. Please stand as you are.
trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things. Let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and the world in need. We turn to you for meaning, holy God. Nurture in your children the gifts of the Spirit poured out in baptism, and let the mind of Christ guide the church. Give wisdom and discernment to our bishops, pastors, deacons, teachers, and leaders. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We turn to you for renewal. Save lives and ecosystems threatened by pollution and a changing climate. Cleanse the earth's waters and restore the soil. Preserve rainforests, deserts, and wildlife that generations to come may cherish your creation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We turn to you for healing. Send compassionate helpers to any who suffer because of war and violence. Shelter unhoused people. Befriend those who are lonely. Bring hope to any in despair and console the bereaved. We pray for Jeff Flood and others we name now. Hear us, O oh God. We turn to you for a purpose. Remind us of your faithfulness to this congregation. Increase our trust in your guidance and keep us near the cross. Grant that our acts of service will express Christ's sacrificial love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on your journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share the blessing of Christ's peace. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we take of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You may be seated.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and to keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Generous God. Thanks be 